Um, I, th I think it's a generational thing. I think it's too right. many of them in my generation and they think Riesling is not an American wine. Full stop. It may. Or is Riesling a good wine to begin with? Or right? even maybe yeah, yeah. un American activity. <laughs> I doubt it. it. Beware of this product. Its <laughs> consumption is an un American activity. It <laughs> may lead to your presence and a U.S. government facility in Guantanamo Bay. Europeanization. <laughs> well, I thought Americans liked it sweet, right? So originally, originally let's, yeah. let's get into that. Yeah. Hi, uh, Internet. I'm Dan, and I'm Chaz, and this is Wine and Serious Business episode 239. We're here today with Stuart Piggott. Thank you so much for taking some time with us. He is a world travel, world writing, world tasting reason expert, maybe. You, 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 Maybe you're uncomfortable with that word, I guess I don't but, but you've got a lot of experience with Riesling. You've engaged a lot of people about Riesling. We're here at the Riesling Invasion and he agreed to talk Riesling a little bit with us. And we were just I'm talking sure about uh, talking about wines in America and the impression, you know, like we're on the search for the great American Riesling, and he was just saying that that's something interesting to search out. I think so. Yeah. What was your first experience with American Riesling that caught oh, your attention? That's a very good question, because that is a hell of a long time ago. Well, that's also good. the moment that I became um, professionally involved in wine. I was, wow. I was nice. a student in London and uh, I was short of money. You know, there could be a couple of other students who are also short of money in this world. And I did all kinds of totally boring jobs. Oh my God, you can't believe the, the shit I did. It's all done by computer now. But then I got very lucky and a restaurant employed me as a barman and because of the way they had this very strange way they had their wine service set up actually i was having to open and check every single bottle of wine that was being served there nice. and they had a great selection of wines uh, from france germany but also had an astonishing they had a whole page of american wines back in 1981. no wow well, wow. one Where? of those wines was a dessert recently from a winery in Sonoma County, California called Chabot um, San Jim. And oh. this wine had the rather unpronounceable name of Individual Dry Bunch Select Plate Pulse. Or IDBSLH. That was really? the they that? that was the acronym <laughs> which all the freaks knew this wine oh. about. Amazing. And, and it was only available in half bottles. Uh, um, it was an um, incredibly concentrated dried fruits and spice and honey flavors. That stuff was off the scale. Awesome. Awesome. See, and that's a bit of, man, a bit of Riesling history that I had in my life. There was stuff like that going on. It, it was, was 1977 then. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's cool. cool. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to, uh, let, let's start talking about the wines we've got yes. in front of us today. Uh, we picked out three that we're presenting uh, at, at uh, the Riesling Invasion. This is the Viento, right? No, this is actually the Trasada. This is the Trasada. Yeah. yeah, the Ribbon Ridge Estate Riesling. Um, Trasada is definitely one of the big Riesling players in Oregon right now. Had their wines in the show a number of times. And we really love that they work with different sites. They work really hard on making a bunch of different styles to really bring all the variety of Riesling that's available to the front. Um, what, what's your experience been with Trasader in the past? Well, um, I think 2011 was the first vintage when I bumped into them. Mm -hmm. um, that was quite good, but I think the, the, the wines from the new vintage 2013 are another league altogether. Um, and any winemaker who's starting out with something that doesn't fit extremely neatly into some very conventional box is going to have to work very hard to get from doing it well to doing it extremely well. That is a very tough challenge. And they started doing it very well and have been pushing the envelope ever since then. And um, I think these are the best points they've made so far. Awesome. I, I feel the same way about them. They're really pushing the envelope. And like, but, you know, as, as American Reason continues to, to grow and make its mark, like they're, they're part of the yeah. yeah. well, movement. Like the love that they're giving it to, uh, giving to Riesling in the sense that like, a lot of people do that with Pinot, right? They make up just individual barrels, they sort of blend them together and decide what's going to go into what blend or, or what are the quality levels going to cut. 
Riesling often gets bulked into like, oh, they made our big 500 gallon bin of, of Riesling and that's what we sell. Um, which we're seeing that really gets a lot of attention from all different blocks, all different from all over the place. It's really fanatic. Yeah, it's got a uh, best sense. Look, yeah. that about Riesling. Riesling draws that, right? Riesling draws fanatic. It's a great for fanatic. Uh, yeah, I think rather like Pinot you know, Noir, it's kind of a hotbed of fanaticism. And there's a little bit of a lunatic fringe always who take things too far. But the positive side is if one or two people are going too far, then, you know, 10, 20% are pushing it too far, 70, 80, 90%. Uh, hitting the top, and right. it's not so bad. That's a good place to Yeah. I think it's alright people take it too far, right? How will you know where the limit is? Exactly. Are, if you never go that far, you never know where the right point is. Right. Very simple. Yeah. I feel like the nose on this is pretty light. Um, just a little bit of fruit going on the nose. Just a little it's bit still very young. This can only have been in the bottle for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think really nice and flexible. It has fantastic. It says on the back of the label, you have the IRF taste profile, which is on the labels of a lot of Rieslings, and it says this Riesling is medium dry. Uh, medium dry, anything which is medium sounds stupid, boring, uh, why bother? Um, well, and then that dry to that. But it, at least it it tells you where you are that this wine is not bone dry. Um, but what you're getting in the in terms of flavor is extra terrestrial. Give this wine a few months longer and it will blow your mind because it is so intense, yet so subtle, so sexy, and it is still really light. I promise you, you can drink a whole bottle of this wine in the evening and it will not impair your ability to realize your fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah. I'll <laughs> we'll test that out later, but yes. Well, that's my recommendation. Yeah. I think it's just they put a lot of love and a lot of care and really a lot of blending and winemaking skill on this estate. Yeah, but but totally, totally similar to his, his style in the past. Textually, this wine is fantastic. A little bit of sugar lends uh, a good amount of body to the wine. And the yeah, acid is very true. Paired, yeah. paired very well with it. Like, if the, if the sugar is there without being. Like, the wine does not taste sweet. No. Absolutely no. not. Yeah, as soon as the acid no. comes in, it feels very dry. Um, and I think Let me say, there are a bunch of big brand Chardonnays out there that taste way, way sweeter than this stuff. Yeah. And also, they are much. And there's more dry. Yeah. I'm sorry, do you want to die at boredom? If you don't, go up there and buy one of those big brand Chardonnays which are widely distributed, you may die <laughs> or be wet. Safe to see, he's here to help you. Jazz and I never provide safety advice. He's already taken the show to a new level. <laughs> for, uh, for, for wine number two, yeah. uh, we had a bit of an experiment. Uh, we, we stopped at the registration desk and said we would walk down the hallway, turn the corner, and stop at the third winery on the right. Yes. Um, that brought us to the so uh, end. So. We'll 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 drink. Yeah. We'll like to get some little drinking. All right. We we'll talked about. I hope you've done that before. <laughs> uh, only a few times. Dude, we don't have. I promise you, I have done it several times, <laughs> and I'm talking about today. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll we'll do it several more. more. I will do it several more times. Yes. So these guys are located in the gorge. I don't know a lot about them. Some of my friends I know have been excited about them. He said that these uh, these vines were planted in 1981, um, and they've kind of been a, a kind of been a standard in the area. Um, they have a wide range of gorge wines, and I think uh, kind of like entry level reds is kind of how I was introduced to Nieto. Um, but I wasn't too familiar with the reason. So this was a new experience for you as well, right? Uh, a very new experience yeah. for me. Uh, I was not aware that there was a significant reason production in the gorge. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah I, not, I, I wasn't really either. I mean, if you would ask me, I would think, yeah, some people are probably doing it, but... Yeah. but yeah, I, I thought there was some in the gorge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, not really heard of, but it's more like Washington yeah. side, right? Like, yeah, like, but Yacht Run's packed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, so I'll see you back into, uh, like, uh, right? way up into eastern Washington. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, the, the interesting thing uh, for me about this wine is, you know, some people, uh, not without reason, say, 
that, you know, argon freezing can be quite tolerant. And if it is bone dry, then you should be aware of the fact that it will be quite tolerant. Yeah. Either you like that or you don't. No. But uh, some people, it freaks them out a little bit, it's too extreme. I, I can understand, everybody's taste is different. You know, there are things which I don't like either. You know, red wines with 18 degrees of alcohol uh, might be a little bit too much for me. I might start saying outrageous things. I might even pick something up and throw it across the You know, outrageous, think outrageous behavior in, in response to what I consider an outrageous wine. Yes. Let's say it. <laughs> no. um, so here, uh, I think, uh, uh, recently from this part of America, with a very harmonious acidity, this is not that tart at all. Yeah. I, I totally yeah. agree. When we were discussing this before we started, it really is a good representative wine in that sense, where they're, they're right, the acidity isn't sharp, it's still present. It's not no. a flabby wine by any stretch of the imagination. No. Um, but, but no, I think very few people would describe this as too acidic either. And they also, oh. it delivers on the dry too. It's definitely not a sweet wine. No, it's a totally dry so, wine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No. Um, so it's not knocking my socks off with complexity. Uh, no, the flavors are enjoyable. It's got a great good harmony. Yeah, yeah, the balance is yeah. there, I think. I think it delivers that well. Great. Well, so, talk about, I had a question about dry wines. Uh, in particular, like what you pair with your dry reason. Because I've got a lot of love for smear reason, especially German. Uh, reasons I have a lot of things I love pairing with them, particularly spicy dishes. I think sure, really that's really a great, great combination. Right. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to like bone dry reasoning, uh, I struggle with it. What do, what, do you, what do you mean with it? Well, I think it's very simple. You look at the other foods which people recommend bone dry, fresh, white wines for. Okay. Uh, let's start with our friend, friends, the oysters. Yes. Yeah. And other uh, 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 yeah. of course, yeah. You go down the same route, to them. you look at the same combinations, and they work extremely well. Okay. Yeah. So, so then, uh, to sweet reasons, what is your favorite single uh, food, food pairing? Uh, sweet reasons. Uh, ribs. ribs. Let's say ribs. ribs. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, like American barbecue style, or like American barbecue style? Right. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's, that's one I haven't tried. I haven't so. either. So I'm excited. We'll have to do that. We have to have dinner out at some point. There's a reason. There's a reason. A, reason. a, a, reason. a, a lot of acid, lower on acid. Um, uh, the important thing is, is just that there's enough sweetness in the wine. If the reasoning is saying the IR scale is saying medium dry, that is too dry for the ribs. Okay. It's got to say medium sweet or bottom end of sweet. I think that, that is, excuse me, the sweet spot. Awesome. Okay. I know that sounds tautological, but there you go. Let's, uh, and let's, before we get into the third wine, let's let you talk about your book a little bit. So yeah, absolutely. This, this book just came out, The Best White Wine on Earth, written by Story. You've been working on this for years, right? Um, what is years? Yeah. Um, we tried to do this thing as fast as possible. I started researching on 1st of February 2012, and it came out on 17th of June 2014. That sounds like a long time, but if you're going right around the world, and you're acquiring through hundreds, of producers looking to find the best, to find that which is essential. Um, I was all the time I was asking myself, what can I put into 200 pages and no more? Wow. I did not want to produce this, you know, like some damn Bible. Yeah. Wine Bible. Yeah. The Bible is the Bible, and why the books should not imitate it. Yeah. So I wanted a compact book that told um, a global story. That was the challenge. Uh, That's tough to fit into other pages. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, and I think that, that uh, when I hear you, when I heard you, heard, you, heard you talk, read some of your articles online, one thing I really like is that in addition to talking about the wines themselves, you really talk about the culture surrounding the wine, the people that love it, and the people that make it. And I think that the reason phenomenon that we were talking about, how it kind of like draws in fanatics, um, it also draws in people, people inclined towards mathematical precision too, right? Like I, I think there's a. There's oh, a, I would say. You've got everything from the mathematically precise type of winemakers to the Jimi Hendrix type of winemakers. Oh. It, it pulls in both those extremes and a bunch of people in the middle. And do you see more similarities or more differences between reason and culture as you travel around the world? I suppose.
to me the things which stand out and the differences because sure. um, that's what I'm looking for. You know, what makes Oregon different from South Australia or from Austria or from Idaho? You know? um, uh, those, those are really interesting questions and, uh, um, you know, all that stuff fascinates me. So where do you think... Do you have some advice for the Oregon Riesling culture then? Like what's something that we could benefit from thinking about more? Not necessarily on the production side, but on the on the drinking side, on the enthusiast side. What's um, something that we need to open our minds to or embrace more? Well, I think considering that a lot of Oregon Riesling does have plenty of acidity, um, I think uh, being more reminded about the sweetness is a very helpful thing. Uh, wines like the, uh, the Trisatum, which we just tasted, you can see how a little hint of sweetness does a great deal for that wine. Um, the Bomb Dry stuff has its place as well. As we saw with our friend here, I have to look, because I didn't know the producer before we spoke to him a minute ago, Viento, um, those wines also have their place. These are two different worlds, uh, two different parts of the, the multicolored Riesling taste spectrum. And each of them gives you different possibilities at the dining table, simply if you're drinking and enjoying it. Fantastic. On to our final wine. We decided to uh, go away from the American wines to provide a reference point from Germany, uh, Mosul Valley, near and dear to all of our hearts. The Double yeah. G. Yeah, I was going to say, wow, you picked up a great what, uh, what made well. you? What made you go for this one? Um, this um, is. Uh, Riesling from Dr. Lozen on the Mosel. Um, uh, recent dry Riesling of the new GG category. Um, you don't need to know what GG stands for, but you do need to look, know what the GG stands for. High end single vineyard Rieslings um, in this dry direction. And um, I, I wanted to show a German wine which is not sweet because I think still so, so many people think German wine sweet. Yeah. And the problem with that is not uh, the attitude in itself, it's rather the people say it's on the street. Uh, That's what they get uh, used to. Yeah. Yeah. And low expectations. Yeah, and then low expectations because they quite yeah. possibly had some bad experiences with some very cheap um, yes. German white wine that was very sweet. And indeed, only yeah. sweet. Yeah, the, the, oh, the, yeah. 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 Portland doesn't get a huge amount of, of really high-end dry reasons. It's it, yeah, it's, not, a, it's a lot more. Of a they're, they're available, but but uh, yeah, I have to look for them. Right, look for them. Yeah. 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 Talk about picking it up a notch. This just smells and tastes fantastic. <laughs> it tastes like stones in or smells like stones in a stream. I think to me, like there's that just on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. we saw stone. Yeah. Oh, there you go. My apologies, <laughs> here is the stone. Yes. The holy stone has been transported from the Mosul Valley to Portland, Oregon. Yeah. I present it to you. No, <laughs> the stone. <laughs> little piece of slate, and the, and the vines come out of just a pile. Yeah, you yeah. see it's a very sharp stone. This is a flake of it. Look at it one way, it's very thin, the other it's broad. Um, this um, uh, is a layered rock very thin layers, and if you hit a piece of it, then a flake will flake off like this. Um, it's a, a brutal soil. Um, there, there's not much of what you or I would call dirt in there. No? The vines uh, uh, struggle a bit in the moles, all this works because they have quite a lot of summer rain. Uh, it's very important for the vines. A lot of people think the vine needs sun, 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 and only sun. Well, this is nonsense. It's, and I'll think of the plants um, in your garden. If they don't get enough rain, they keel over. The vine is not much different. It is not a cactus. Yeah? <laughs> so yes, to, so to, to go straight into stone like this, they probably have to struggle quite a bit, right? The first years are difficult, yeah. I saw so one of our friends, Barnaby, uh, Barnaby and Olga uh, Tuttle, they, they actually used a, a jackhammer to, to put the vines in the first time at a rock quarry in mm -hmm. one of their friend zones when they're planting the initial vineyard. Um, there's like some great pictures of them with like one of those jackhammer, the 
Is that what it's called? Yeah. 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 Like actually, it's only down into the rocks. Into the rocks just to plant the initial vines. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Explosives may be necessary, <laughs> but they offer a peaceful purpose. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the best possible uses. Of it. I absolutely agree. Yes. Whereas Oregon can be like a, a lot more like apple driven, a lot of citrus. Yes. Uh, this this is more leaning towards like stone fruits. Yes. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't sort of, sort of bit, I wouldn't go all the way tropical with it, but it's like a ripe stone fruit um, with none of the weight. There's yeah, no there's a little sense of delicacy. Right? Te texturally, it's fantastic. There are yes, some flowers, blossoms. Not so shabby. No. Yeah, I'm forcing it down. <laughs> it's awfully hard. It's so clean. As it's you so can down. see, yeah. it's struggling. <laughs> Just like those vines. Life is hard. <laughs> Good German Riesling. Like, like. <laughs> Drinking Riesling is hard. It's, yeah. it's a brutal experience. I don't recommend it. Yeah. It's been a hard life the last couple of years. Yeah, yeah very much so. <laughs> yeah. It was a tough route. You know, didn't know how, whether I'd make it to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Good German reason for me is a lot like good champagne. It can just put a smile on your face, right? True. This is, is, that's a very good comparison. I, I think those wines do have a lot of similarity. Yeah. Mostly like you taste it, and like the, the initial reaction forced me to say a word with a smile. Like it, so. yeah. And this does that for me. This is texturally, the way it tastes, the way it smells, is fantastic. So, and, and, and yeah, distinctly German. So. Yeah. We are not saying it, but some of the wine media would say this is a buy recommendation. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. <laughs> and how much this one costs? Uh, uh, that one's not cheap, I'm afraid. Yeah, I would say this is 60? 60? Uh, I, I have no idea. Okay. Have to ask yeah. Well, but this, these are like, we, we know as like the quality level steps up to like Oshley's, uh, Baron Oshley's, like the price goes up because there's a lot of care in those wines. And this is like, the GG qualification is sort of like that amount of it care. Is, it's is comparable, but on the dry side. Absolutely. Absolutely. You've got to say, too, a wine from from one you know one of the, the like long-time solid producers in the Mosul, a wine from one of the best vineyards in the world of any kind for anything, right? You take you take that kind of pedigree, apply it to any number of other grapes, and the prices of those wines are going to be 10x what, yes. you, pay it, totally. what you pay for this. Uh, there is no one problem. I mean the yeah. one at the front of the three figure price. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. don't get that with Riesling more than a couple of times in the whole world. Yeah. yeah. So one, another way that's really easier, it's another thing that I really love about these wines is that the price uh, to get the, the highest end German wines is not outside of what I hope we can afford. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, whereas in Burgundy or, or other places, it's, it's, it's impossible. We can't afford yeah. wines. Right. No, so it's, so it's really I love about yeah. Germany. And while it's still available, step it up, man. Awesome stuff. So, in the world of Riesling, uh, well, I guess a couple, of, two, two recommendations. I guess one in the world of Riesling at large, who is uh, who is a region that maybe we don't know about that that we should seek out to try, and then second, in the Mosul Valley, can you name a producer that maybe doesn't have the biggest fame that everybody okay. should make? I'll, I'll start with the Mosul Valley because right. one of the the ultimate classic regions in the world for Riesling. Well, you know, it's interesting, so much change there. Um, a bunch of young winemakers came from nowhere. Um, 2005 was the first vintage for a, a young couple. Their winery is called Weiser, W-E-I-S-E-R, hyphen Künstler, K-U-N-S-T-L-E-R. They, they came from nowhere in 2005, and from the first vintage, every wine they made was fantastic. You know, before that, those kind of people came along, that was supposed to be impossible. I've had the wine, I think it's great. Yeah. And very the, the very last wine I put into that book was the first really exciting reasoning I had from Argentina. Awesome. I thought, you know, it was difficult enough to find a, really, a couple of really interesting people in Chile, but Argentina was like a ball breaker. God, that was that was the toughest that was the toughest job I had. And the very uh, literally the absolutely last moment there it was on the table. <laughs> wow. Um, and it was sensational. I showed it to two or three. I was in Berlin 
At the time, I showed it to two, three friends without telling them anything about it. They said, "Wow, what is that?" Story? I love it when that happens. Yeah, that's what makes this job. And that's the doing. truth, right? And it's like, just try it. No preconceptions. And you're exactly. Like, that's special. Yes. Right. It was exactly that yeah. situation. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Some tidbits of knowledge. Some cool wines. A cool book. Cool guest. A great guest. Yeah. Thank, yeah, you. thank we, you for doing the show. With we us. always wrap up. Yeah. Yeah. Where the guest asks a question of the audience. Hopefully, we get comments to respond. Is there anything you'd like to know? Any question you'd like to ask? It, it can be wine related. It can be related to the weather or whatever of the people that have watched this. What is the best Oregon Riesling that is not in my book? Awesome question. And there is a yes. prize for the for the best answer to that question. Uh, a special bottle from my cellar in Berlin. I will arrange for the ship. That's very cool. We're going to put a time limit on these things because we have to for a question like that. You've got two weeks from the date that this show goes online. Two weeks, the best answer, we'll turn them all into him. He'll be the judge in the end, of course, but after wow. two weeks, we'll submit it all. So that's a really cool question. Thanks for making that offer. We're surrounded by oppressive people talking all about reason. Everybody wants a piece of his time. I can't thank you enough for taking Truly. some of that precious thank time you. to hang out with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to watch. Cheers. Cheers. Have a wonderful day.